business matters first. Uh, how was the exam? A lot of thumbs up. So by singing louder, that made a difference in terms of how difficult I made the exam. Did that, that play through? Yeah. No? So there's some dissenting opinions on that, I guess. OK. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed. I didn't notice until I was grading it uh, this weekend. But uh, the, uh, it, the first section, the numbers went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Anybody notice that? I. Somehow, between me and the secretary, something happened where questions six, seven, and eight disappeared, uh, which meant that I gave you all nine points to start. So um, I honestly don't know how that happened. I made your day here, right? Yeah. It was weird. I don't know. I mean, I know, in fact, when I wrote the questions, I wrote about 20 questions for the first section. And so I was cleaning them out. So something happened between me and the secretary, I don't know what it was, but in any event, there was only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay. Uh, the exams are not graded. Uh, they, I've told the TAs I really, really, really want to have them available for you, if, if at all possible, on Wednesday. So uh, we're working very hard. I finished my section of it grading uh, this weekend, and uh, I was fairly pleased. I graded the very first section in the, in the exam, and I was fairly pleased in general with performance on that. Um, so I, 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 they're, they're doing the problems and the longer things. Um, but I, <clears throat> I was not unhappy with what I saw in that first section. So that, that was a, hopefully a good indicator for you. Okay. Um, let's see. Second, uh, yes, we will meet class on Wednesday. So uh, I know a lot of people are calling class off. We can't do that. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have class on Wednesday. We'll, we'll be videotaping it as, as usual. So that's probably the lowest attendance of the term. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you need to stay on top of that. Uh, I also want to offer, my wife and I have a, a thing with Thanksgiving dinner. If anybody's in town and you're not planning to go anywhere else, give me a holler. I'd uh, love to have you over. So it'll be uh, fun. We could have turkey and wild times. So uh, good for that. So I guess if you're hanging around on Wednesday, maybe you get a benefit or something, right? Okay. Um, let's see. What I want to do today is I want to finish up um, some things about sugar metabolism. And I haven't decided, in fact, fully what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll kind of play this one. Today's kind of playing it by ear day. Uh, we've got gluconeogenesis to talk about. And I haven't decided whether to talk about that or to talk more about regulation first. But I guess I'll see how we uh, get going through things. I will say a couple things uh, relative to final, which is where your attentions are now turning. First of all, the final, I believe, is on Wednesday evening at 6 PM. I hate those. I don't know if you do, but I hate those. Um, and uh, on the final exam, uh, I give you a note card that you can use. You can fill out both sides, et cetera. You have to get the card from me. I'm going to say this. I'm going to probably say this several times so it's absolutely clear. You have to get the card from me. Okay? If you bring in another card, uh, you will not be allowed to use it, and you will lose points. So you have to bring in a card from me. All right? Am I clear on that? All right? And if you don't bring in any card, you will lose points. So you have to bring in a card from me. There's a reason for doing this, OK? I, I can explain it after the term is over, but there's a reason for doing that. All right? One of the things I want to make sure is that you're filling the card out yourself. And the reason I do that is because there's a real benefit you're going to discover in filling this card out. And if your roommate from last year who took it gives you their card, OK, then you didn't fill it out. You're not going to derive the benefit from it. And so your roommate won't be able to do that because I also collect the cards at the end and I don't give them back. So if you want to have the information on the card, you're welcome to photocopy it and so forth. And you can photocopy that information, but you will have to turn the card in to me okay, at the exam. That's why I say if you come in with no card, you're going to lose points. Make sense? OK, so we'll talk more about that. The other is, um, how should I start studying for the final? And my uh, guideline for the final is the number of new, the amount of new stuff on the final is proportional to the coverage in the term. So divide the total number of, the number of lectures of new material divided by the total lectures of the term. And that's approximately the percentage that you'll see on the final of new material. Okay? The other material will be things you've already talked about. And my guideline there is probably to recommend that you um, use the exams that you've had as guidelines for what to study uh, for the future. You're not going to see the same questions, but you're going to see the same topics clearly. And I think and, hopeful, and, I think and hope that it gives you some focus uh, of what will be on the final. 
Last thing was um, so that people like the exam. Any comments about the exam before I actually dig in to say things? Yeah. Yeah, I, okay, I, and I, I did that, and I, I will tell you that I ended up with the same problem on that that I have every time I do it. And the problem is there's always a few people who don't follow instructions, and then they don't mark things accordingly, and then they contact me and say, but okay, can you, do you have to take points off for me because I didn't do blah, blah, blah. And then I have to make a decision. Is it fair to everybody else to give them that credit when everybody else was responsible or not? I see some heads shaking no. Okay? And then I've got several people who are mad at me because I don't give them credit or whatever. And so it's always a no win for me when I do that. So, and it happened again this year. So I don't know how to deal with that, to be honest with you. I love to do that. I'd like to give you that option, but then I think when I give you that option that it's important that everybody be responsible in how you use that option. And not everybody's done that. So I don't know. I haven't decided. You want that on the final? Yes, please. So if I did that on the final, then... Is everybody going to follow the instructions? Everybody always says yes, and then it's always the, the, the few that don't that get very unhappy with me, and I don't, I don't know what to do with that. So, okay. Um, let's turn our, any other comments about besides that one? Do you like that? Should I make it as hard as possible? Yes, yes. Actually, if you want to move your grade up, the best thing that can happen is an exam as hard as possible because when you move up against the curve, that's how you improve your grade. It's true. Students always say, oh, no, make it easy. If everybody makes 100, you know, nothing's going to change from where, where they are right now. I think the hard exams are more easy. The hard it's exams easy are more easy. Yeah, you can kill him. <laughs> I'm joking. So, Okay. <laughs> All right, so I do appreciate the feedback. If you have other comments that you want to send to me or give to me afterwards, I'll, I'll be happy to take those. All right, um, so let's turn our attention back to talking about um, sugar metabolism. So when I finished last time, um, I was talking about metabolic fates um, of pyruvate and specifically this balancing that happens with uh, redox equations. And so it's very important to consider that. The reason that we have, if I sit on an exam and I ask you the question, why does fermentation exist, I would hope that you would tell me it exists so we can keep glycolysis going when there's no oxygen. Because that's the real reason that fermentation exists. And fermentation exists in us, it exists in bacteria, it exists in yeast, and no, we don't make ethanol, but when we are keeping glycolysis going with something else, that something else is fermentation, and in us that fermentation involves conversion of pyruvate to lactate. So every fermentation involves recycling of NADH to make NAD. Every fermentation involves recycling of NADH to make NAD. No question about that, okay? The reason that that happens is, as I noted in the uh, thing before, not that thing before. Not that thing before. What, what, I did that before, didn't I? Well, now, Kevin, I should have looked at that, shouldn't I? Here, okay? The reason that it exists is to keep the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase reaction going. All right? So if we run out of oxygen, as I noted, when we run out of oxygen, we can't convert NADH to NAD by other means. So the only way that we can convert NADH back to NAD is by fermentation. So if we don't convert NADH back to NAD, then what happens is concentrations of NADH go high. NADH is a product of this reaction. And when the concentration of product accumulates, what happens to the delta G? It becomes more positive. When the delta G for this reaction becomes positive, then we are hosed. Glycolysis can't go. And the time when you need ATP the most is when you have low oxygen. Because you're typically using, you're burning up 
energy faster than your body can deliver oxygen. Okay? You don't want to just shut off everything at that point because the grizzly bear is going to catch you. Okay? So the most important time for you to be keeping glycolysis going is then because that's the only way that you're making ATP then, is those two ATPs per glucose that you're making. So if you convert that ADH back to NAD, then now you have reactant. And when you have reactant increasing, you are favoring the reaction going forwards. So that's very, very important to, uh, a very, very important consideration. Okay, uh, this of course is not going on in us, this is going on in bacteria and yeast because you see acetaldehyde and ethanol. But um, in us, we're converting pyruvate to lactate. Okay, uh, so I hope I've hammered that, that point home enough because that's a very important uh, point to understand. All right, now I've also alluded to the fact when I talked about glycolysis that other uh, sugars can be metabolized in um, glycolysis as well. To do so, they simply have to be converted into something that's useful for the cell. Okay? So this illustrates how some other sugars can come uh, into the uh, pathway. We can see galactose can be converted ultimately to glucose 6-phosphate. I'll show you how that goes in just a minute. And fructose, of course, not surprisingly, can come in um, through this pathway here to make fructose 6-phosphate. And then, of course, fructose 6-phosphate is already an intermediate in the process. Later today, I'm going to hopefully convince you that this process um, of, of bringing fructose in is a real problem. And it's, it, this is the, the, the famous Kevin Ahern's theory of obesity, why Americans are getting obese. And I'm going to give you that uh, in just a little bit. Okay? But first, let's focus our attention on galactose. Galactose is a sugar that looks very much like glucose. And um, we get galactose in our diet by drinking milk, dairy products. Okay. Lactose, of course, contains glucose and galactose. And if we don't do something about the galactose, we will have problems, as I uh, will show you. All right? So to, to metabolize galactose, we first convert galactose into something called galactose 1-phosphate. This is a reaction that's catalyzed by the enzyme galactokinase and um, requires ATP. The main thing is we make galactose 1-phosphate. Galactose 1-phosphate is converted into glucose 1-phosphate in this process I'm going to describe, all right? Now, before I describe the process, I will point out that glucose 1-phosphate is not an intermediate in glycolysis, okay? It's not an intermediate in glycolysis. But glucose 1-phosphate can, can be converted into glucose, glucose 6-phosphate by an enzyme known as phosphoglucomutase. So glucose 1-phosphate can be moved into glycolysis by conversion into glucose 6-phosphate. Everybody with me there? All right. Well, here, here is how we make glucose 1-phosphate. So the aim of this pathway is to make glucose 1-phosphate. Uh, yeah, glucose 1-phosphate. We start with galactose 1-phosphate from the last reaction that I showed you. If we take galactose 1-phosphate, and we take this molecule UDP glucose that you've seen previously, and we'll see that this molecule is also important for glycogen metabolism. If we add these two guys together in the presence of this enzyme whose name isn't really important, okay? If we add them two together in the presence of this enzyme, we basically put the galactose onto the UDP and we split off the glucose 1-phosphate that was on there, all right? So, so far, all we've done is we've now made UDP galactose, and we've split off a glucose 1-phosphate. Everybody with me? I just simply swapped the galactose for the glucose, so I have UDP galactose, and now I have glucose 1-phosphate instead of galactose 1-phosphate. Now, in the next step, UDP galactose is converted into... UDP glucose, that is the galactose is converted. You see that this OH, which is up in galactose, is moved down in this, and we now have UDP glucose. UDP glucose, of course, is what this was. So each time this cycle turns, it produces one molecule of glucose 1-phosphate. In essence, we are converting galactose 1-phosphate into glucose 1-phosphate, and it's about a two or three step process. Now, as a result of this pathway, we can make galactose into glucose 1-phosphate. It turns out that that's a very important thing to do. 
Because if we're lacking an enzyme, specifically either one of these enzymes, but usually this one, the top enzyme, and again, the names of the enzymes aren't important here. If we're lacking either of these enzymes for metabolizing galactose, then what happens is galactose, free galactose accumulates. And when free galactose accumulates, we end up with a problem. Okay? Galactose in high concentrations will be converted by the body into galactitol. Galactitol is just like galactose, except for it's reduced. It has a hydroxyl group instead of an aldehyde group. Galactitol can crystallize. And the place where it can most commonly crystallize is in the lens of your eye. In the lens of your eye, that's how you make cataracts. So if you're deficient or, for some reason, not making an awful lot of um, those enzymes necessary for metabolizing galactose, you're going to be much more prone to having cataracts arising from this reaction right here. Yes? I'm sorry? Okay, so yeah, I'll go back to the last slide. So the last slide's always confusing. confusing. So the product of this last slide, the product is glucose 1-phosphate. Glucose 1-phosphate is not an intermediate in glycolysis, but it can be made into one in a simple reaction involving phosphoglucomutase. We're going to see phosphoglucomutase probably starting on Wednesday or else Monday of next week. Okay? That enzyme can convert glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate. And once you have glucose 6-phosphate, of course, that's metabolized inside of glycolysis. Make sense? Other questions? This is a very common uh, slide for questions. Question about this slide. Yes? Yeah. So the question is, cataracts are more common with age. Does this mean that with age, people are losing the enzymes? The answer to that question, excuse me, um, is probably that there's many ways of making cataracts. Um, so I'll give you one way that it's been established that you can make cataracts that I want all young people to hear. Okay? How many of you guys have ever stuck something in the microwave and you go up and you give it just this eyeball? Okay? How many have done that? Probably everybody in this room has done that. Did you know that microwaves are strongly implicated in cataract formation? And that those barriers are not 100% barriers? Whenever I put something in the microwave oven, I stay a few feet away from it because distance is your best friend. The worst thing that you can do for your eyes is going up and looking at that thing and watching the egg explode in there. Which, by the way, is a very cool thing to do in a microwave if you've never done it, okay? Take, take an egg, <laughs> okay? You have, if you, let's say that maybe you're a home visiting mom, <laughs> or, or, or no, maybe not mom, maybe, maybe some, somebody that you don't like, okay? But you take an egg and you put it in the microwave and you blast it. And what will happen? It will blast your microwave. It really will. Uh, it's a mess. So, for what that's worth, I don't know. Okay, back to biochemistry. Other questions about this? Everybody's got, yeah. Okay, good question. Are there other sources of lactose? Uh, for example, if you're vegan and you're not drinking dairy and so forth, do you get other sources of lactose? There are other uh, much rarer sources of galactose, yes. Galactose is not a necessary nutrient. Okay? So what we're doing here is dealing with lact galactose that we're getting. So it's not like you have to have galactose uh, to do this. Okay? If you are lactating female um, and you are producing milk, then you have enzymes to make galactose. Okay, so that also um, happens, and it's obviously necessary. But it, but you don't have to have galactose in your diet for that either. Okay, other questions? All right. So um, that's the story of galactose. What I'd like to do is um, let's see, is talk a little bit about fructose metabolism. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is, as I said, Kevin's pet theory. I have no evidence for this whatsoever. Okay. But I think I can make a case that's going to convince you that we have an idea about what makes people obese and why it's happened in the last generation. Okay? Why in the last 20 or 30 years are Americans getting more obese? Well, part of it is we don't exercise as much as we ought to. 
But I think there's another contributing factor to it, and that's what I'm going to tell you here. It actually relates to fructose. Okay? In the last 30 years, the proliferation of uh, foods that contain what are called high fructose corn syrup in the American diet has been enormous. High fructose corn syrup is just everywhere. If you don't think so, look at, look at the labels of your foods. You'll see it everywhere. Look on a Coca-Cola. It's made with pure high fructose corn syrup, a little bit of caramel and some carbon dioxide, some phosphoric acid. That's basically what's in it. So the American diet has been growing in the, in the content of high fructose corn syrup. Health food stores used to sell fructose as the natural sugar. They may even still be doing that. I think one of the safest things you can do for your health is to stay away from a health food store, personally. Okay? <laughs> but you go to a health food store, you can buy fructose because it's the natural sugar. Okay? I'm going to convince you you're going to add a few layers of, of, of fat to your gut if you do that. All right? What happens when you get too much fructose? Well, you get... Um, there's a couple things that can happen. One is you can go through that reaction that you saw earlier, which where fructose goes to fructose 6-phosphate and bang. Okay, and you're in glycolysis. What if you have an awful lot of fructose? You're drinking four or five Cokes a day, or maybe one Coke a day. There's so much crap in Coke that maybe one Coke a day would do this. You start overloading your body's ability to handle fructose. What you do is you go through this metabolic pathway. This metabolic pathway takes fructose, and there's an enzyme called fructokinase, which is very much like hexokinase, except for it starts with fructose, and it adds a phosphate onto position one, making fructose 1-phosphate. Okay? Fructose 1-phosphate can be split in half by an enzyme called fructoaldolase, which is another way it's called besides that long name that's up there. You've, you've heard of aldolase already. If you recall, aldolase took fructose 1,6-phosphate and it split it into DHAP and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. That's what aldolase catalyzes. Here's a related enzyme called fructoaldolase, which is taking fructose 1-phosphate and splitting it into glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Well, this guy is an intermediate in glycolysis. Ah, oh, the problem must be glyceraldehyde. No, no, the problem is not glyceraldehyde either because glyceraldehyde can be converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Now, you're all looking at this and going, Ahern's out of his mind today, worse than usual, okay? Because these two guys are normal intermediates in glycolysis, okay? So what's the deal? What's the deal? We've, we've simply started with fructose. We've now got two intermediates in glycolysis. How come we're getting fat? Now, I'm planning an idea in your head. There's a reason why I think we're getting fat based on this, okay? And I hope and think it's going to become apparent to you when I start talking about regulation. And I want you to keep this reaction in your head as I'm talking about regulation, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about now. And what I want to convince you is that the reason that you're getting fat is this process bypasses a regulatory step in glycolysis. You start force-feeding fat metabolism. You start force-feeding fat metabolism. Okay, so keep this thing in mind. I'll come back and refer to it in a bit. Questions about this before I go forwards? Okay, so we've got some alternative reactions happening when our fructose, constant, our fructose con intake is high. Another question I get uh, about this is actually related to lactose, and what is lactose intolerance, and is this something I should think about or worry about? And the answer is probably not. You're going to find this more... Um, uncomfortable than anything else. Lactose, of course, is a disaccharide that contains galactose and glucose. And this is how we get our galactose, as I mentioned earlier. So you see it being produced here by action of an enzyme called lactase. Lactase is an enzyme that we all have uh, and that we all produce when we are infants because this is uh, a necessary reaction for an infant to uh, gain energy. As we get older, um, we tend to lose our ability to make lactase. So the older you get, the more likely you're going to become lactose intolerant. There's a little bit of, of um, uh, difference with, with um, ethnic groups as well. Asians tend to uh, have to stop producing uh, lactase a lot sooner than others do. And so they have a little bit more problem with uh, lactose intolerance, although it's not absolute. Okay? And what happens if you don't produce lactase is lactose accumulates. And when lactose accumulates, there are plenty of bacteria in your gut that don't normally have an awful lot to eat that now all of a sudden have a heck of a lot to eat. And they're very good at producing gas, a lot of gas. 
Okay. And so what happens if you're lactose intolerant is you get stomach cramps, you may have, be producing a lot of gas, you may have some real problems related to that, and it's coming from the bacteria that are metabolizing something that they don't normally get. Normally if you get this and you break it down, you're going to absorb it into your bloodstream and go do things with it. This guy isn't absorbed into the bloodstream and it starts feeding these bacteria. So that's what lactose intolerance is and why lactose uh, intolerance is uh, a problem. Okay. Let's talk about regulation. So regulation of glycolysis is, as I mentioned earlier, unusual and important. It's unusual in that we've got three different places where the pathway is regulated. We've got several mechanisms of, of regulating the pathway. And um, the most important one is not the first one. It's actually the second well, it's, it's the third enzyme. It's, 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 the, um, it's not the first enzyme. It's the third enzyme in the pathway. Okay. And it's this enzyme that's being bypassed with that fructose reaction I was showing you earlier. So let's look at what this enzyme does uh, to begin with. So this enzyme is called phosphofructokinase. It's also called PFK. And phosphofructokinase um, is an enzyme that is allosterically regulated and... Actually, I started to say, I say something I didn't want to say. It's, it's allosterically regulated. It's allosteric regulation is interesting. It's regulated by another thing that's regulated covalently, but allosteric regulation is the only regulation of PFK. The allosteric regulation of PFK is very unusual. And I'm going to help, you so, help, help, help me solve a problem with this. The allosteric regulation uh, looks like this, okay? There's several things that will allosterically either activate or inactivate PFK. One of the things that will inactivate PFK is ATP. We see we have high concentrations of ATP. The reaction velocity goes down. The reaction velocity goes down. We have high concentrations of ATP. So ATP is an allosteric inhibitor of the enzyme. I'll say that again. ATP is an allosteric inhibitor of PFK. Now, this should come as a surprise to some of you. Why should it come as a surprise? It should come as a surprise to all of you, but probably maybe some, only some of you will realize this. Why should this be a surprise? Well, you need ATP, but ATP um, regulates other things, so that's, that's not it. But, but you're on the right track. Yeah? It doesn't take a phosphate, no. It's an allosteric regulator. But in, in the reaction it catalyzes, it does. So go ahead and say a little bit more about that. Think about that further. Well, the fact that it's actually decreasing high concentrations of ATP is odd because that's its source for transferring phosphate. Okay, so are you getting what he's saying here? ATP is a substrate of this enzyme. Now, here's a substrate for the enzyme that in high concentrations is inhibiting the enzyme. Does that seem odd? It should. How is it that at low concentrations, when you would expect the reaction to be going the least fast, it's the best, and at high concentrations, when you would expect the reaction to be going gangbusters, it's the worst? This is where you're going to solve the problem. How can this possibly be? Yes? The ultimate purpose of glycolysis is to produce ATP, but we're talking about this one reaction right now. So how is it that this molecule is having these seemingly opposite effects on one enzyme? The answer is within the, this enzyme. Yes? Is it binding at different places? She's got it right here, okay? So it turns out this enzyme has two different binding sites for ATP. It has, an, it has a binding site at the catalytic, at the active site, that's a substrate binding site, and it has a separate allosteric binding site. Which one has the higher KM? There's a good exam question. Which one has the higher KM? What'd you say? So I have a vote for substrate. There's only one other thing to vote for. What does high KM mean? Low affinity. So what does low affinity mean? It takes a lot of it to act, right? 
Which one has the higher KM? The allosteric binding site has a higher KM. At low concentrations, the substrate binding site on the enzyme really likes ATP. It grabs a hold of it, it uses it, it does its thing. When ATP concentration starts to get high, the allosteric binding site now starts getting filled and turns the enzyme off. It's kind of cool. Okay. So those two sites inside of PFK cause PFK to um, be able to respond as the cell needs to for energy. That's another thing to think about here. Several of you have pointed out that cells need ATP. They need ATP at certain times, and other times they don't need ATP. So, for example, when I am running and jumping and playing, I need ATP. I want to have this enzyme be active because I need ATP, and I need ATP by measured by the fact that my ATP concentrations during those conditions are low. Right? When I'm sitting around watching the tube, drinking beer, eating pizza, I'm not burning it up. My ATP concentrations are high. I don't want to keep burning glucose. So I turn the enzyme off. Okay? So this enzyme is responding very nicely to the energetic needs of the body. Very, very nicely to the energetic needs of the body. Now, what we're going to see with this enzyme is there's several things that actually regulate it. ATP is one, but it's not the most important thing. The most important regulator of the enzyme is a molecule that students oftentimes get confused about. This molecule is called F26BP. It stands for fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which sounds an awful lot like fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, but it ain't the same thing. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is not, underlying not, a molecule of glycolysis, even though it sounds like one that is. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV, right? Same sort of thing, right? It sounds like a molecule of glycolysis, but it's not, right? Okay. It gets more confusing than that because it turns out fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made by an enzyme that also sounds like it belongs in glycolysis. It's made by an enzyme called phosphofructokinase 2. Okay? We'll talk more about that later. But F26BP turns out to be an exquisitely um, sensitive activator of PFK, meaning at very low concentrations of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, the enzyme velocity goes up. Look at this. At one micromolar fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, here's the velocity of the enzyme. Okay? In every case, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate causes the enzyme to be more active even when there's a decent amount of ATP. Now we're going to see later how fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made by cells in response to the needs of the body relative to hormones, okay, responding to hormones that are there, and giving the body what it needs is a very big boost, even under conditions where, for example, ATP concentrations might be high. We'll see how that plays in later. Okay? But this molecule is a very, very important molecule, and its regulation ties in both the metabolism of sugars as well as the metabolism of glycogen, which is a polymer that contains glucose. And we'll see how that, that happens next week. Okay, so fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a very, very important regulator of PFK. Okay? Here's where people get confused. How do you make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate? You make it from fructose 6-phosphate. Oh, man, if you're making this, then glycolysis isn't going. That's probably the first thing that occurs to you. If you're making this guy, then we're not doing glycolysis. No, no. Keep in mind, at any given time, you have millions of these going in the straight up and down pathway. Millions. In any given cell, you have millions of them. You may have a handful of these going this way. So you're not bypassing glycolysis when you do this. In fact, as you do this, you're probably going to favor glycolysis actually going on. So you're just taking a little bit out of this. Remember that we have different alternative routes on that 
that roadmap that I showed you earlier, this is one of those, in, those alternate routes. Fructose 6-phosphate can go to a couple of things. That's important. Okay. Um, there's the structure, not surprisingly. There's fructose, and you see carbon number two with a phosphate, and you see carbon number six with a phosphate. Okay. You'll notice that it's in the beta configuration. Uh, blah, we're not going to talk about that. And blah, we're not going to talk about that. Okay. The other enzyme I want to talk about relative to, to glucose metabolism, by the way, I said there are three enzymes. The first one is hexokinase, and its, it's regulation is unusual. It's called substrate level regulation. We won't talk about it here. If you're curious about it, I'd be happy to tell you about it out of class. But you should simply know that it is a regulated enzyme, the mechanism of which I'm not going to have you hold you responsible for. The third enzyme of glycolysis that is regulated, and this is very odd about glycolysis, is the last one, pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase turns out to be a very important regulatory enzyme. Okay? And it turns out that this enzyme is regulated both allosterically and by covalent modification. Allosterically and by covalent modification. The covalent modification of this enzyme Okay, involves addition of a phosphate, and addition of a phosphate converts it into a less active form. How do you suppose this enzyme gets a phosphate? Kinase. There's a specific kinase you've already learned about in class that puts it on there. Do you know which one? Protein kinase A. Protein kinase A puts a phosphate onto this guy. Okay. Now, we put a phosphate on there, we make it less active, we take the phosphate off, we make it more active. The allosteric regulators are fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which activates it, and, and ATP, or alanine, which inactivate it. Now, I'll tell you later why the um, regulation of this enzyme is important. But first, I want to talk about this guy right here, this allosteric regulator. I want you to think back to the aldolase reaction. And the aldolase reaction is the one I pointed out in class that has the, the high delta G0 prime, high positive delta G0 prime value. And I said we had an energy barrier we had to get over. And the energy barrier, I said, involved pushing and pulling. Pushing was what? Pushing was increasing reactants. So if we have an enzyme that's got a high energy barrier and I take off um, and all of a sudden I need um, energy, let's say I'm running, all of a sudden I need energy, I need to start glycolysis going. So I take my hexokinase reaction, I make glucose 6-phosphate. My phosphoglucoisomerase reaction, I make fructose 6-phosphate. My PFK reaction, I make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and I hit the aldolase wall. What happens to the concentration of F16BP if aldolase is not running? It goes up. As the concentration of F16BP goes up, I'm starting to push. I'm starting the pushing process. To make the overall process go, I've also got to pull. And that's where this enzyme comes in. Because the increasing concentrations of F16BP activate pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase starts pulling things ahead of the aldolase reaction. It starts pulling them. It converts PEP into pyruvate, which means the PEP concentration drops. When the PEP concentration drops, that pulls the previous reaction, which means that 2-phosphoglycerate concentration drops. When the 2-phosphoglycerate concentration drops, the 3-phosphoglycerate concentration drops. When the 3-phosphoglycerate concentrate, you get the idea, right? Eventually, the concentration of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and DHAP are going to drop, and now we're pulling the aldolase reaction. This is what facilitates the pulling. By turning on this enzyme, we start removing the products of the previous reactions. That's how pulling actually occurs. Make sense? Clear as mud? 
You're a quiet group today. I always worry when the natives are restless or quiet. Either way, if they're restless or they're quiet, then you get you get a little, up up here. You're a little anxious. Okay, so that's what's happening with this enzyme. Now, why is is regulation of this enzyme important? Let's think about the reaction that this enzyme catalyzes. This, react, this enzyme catalyzes the conversion of PEP to pyruvate. How, how did I describe that reaction? I used two words to describe it. it they're, they're like the two words we use to describe the start of our universe. The Big Bang, right? This was the Big Bang reaction. And I call it the Big Bang. Why? Because there was a lot of energy released in this process. This reaction is very energetically favorable in the direction of producing pyruvate. Okay, so what? Well, cells have to not only break down glucose, they also have to make glucose. We'll see when we talk about gluconeogenesis on Wednesday, we'll see that, in fact, making glucose requires us to convert pyruvate back into PEP and it's a two-step process that takes a lot of energy. We don't reverse this, this pyruvate kinase reaction. We have to do a little two-step around it. Okay? So after two reactions in making glucose, we can go from pyruvate to PEP. What if this enzyme is still active? What's going to happen to the PEP that we just made? It's going to be converted right back into pyruvate. We have to be able to turn this enzyme off so we can make glucose. If we don't, we're going to burn up PEP as soon as we make it. Now, this phenomenon of turning off a breakdown pathway as we turn on a synthesis pathway, or vice versa, turning one off as we turn the other one on, this is called reciprocal regulation. Turning off a breakdown pathway as we turn on a synthesis pathway, and vice versa. Now, technically, recipro reciprocal regulation involves a single molecule. That doesn't happen in this case, but the principle is the same. The principle is that you are not wanting to be making glucose at the same time as you are breaking down glucose. So if you turn off this enzyme, now you can make glucose. If you don't turn off this enzyme, you surely are going to be breaking down glucose. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys are swallowing a lot today. All right. Let's see. Um, glucose transport proteins. I've, I've alluded to these before. The one we've talked about before was GLUT4. Um, you see there are many glucose transport proteins. And glucose transport proteins, I'll remind you, have the function that they... Um, can be floating around in the cytoplasm of the cell, but when the appropriate signal from insulin comes, they get trafficked to being placed in the membrane of the cell. And these gluts will then allow the specific movement into the cell of glucose. And that's what gluts do. Okay? There's a whole bunch of them. They have different specialized functions and places, but they all have the same basic function, which is that of moving glucose. This is relevant for consideration for us because gluts turn out to be very interesting things with respect to cancer. Okay? When we look at cancer, a tumor arises. Most tumors, when they get going, not all, but most tumors are rapidly dividing. They're dividing more rapidly than the cells around them, and they make a little ball of cells making the, the actual tumor. During that process, their energetic needs are high because they're rapidly dividing. They have greater energetic needs than do untransformed cells, that is, non-cancerous cells. As their energetic needs increase, their oxygen needs increase. Just like your muscles need oxygen when you're running, so too do these rapidly dividing cells of the tumor need oxygen. And just like your cells of your muscles that can run low on oxygen, causing you to ferment, so too do tumor cells run low on oxygen as well. When they run low on oxygen, this is true whether it's a muscle cell or a, a tumor cell, 
you have a, a phenomenon known as hypoxia, which essentially means low oxygen concentration. Low oxygen concentration causes the cell to respond to that, whether it's a muscle cell or a tumor cell. This is built into your cells. Being able to respond to low oxygen concentrations is very important. Now, based on what I've told you so far about what happens in low oxygen concentrations, what do you suppose tumor cells are going to be doing more of than regular cells? Fermentation. Okay? They're going to be doing more fermentation. And if they're doing more fermentation, what do you suppose that their glucose needs are going to be relative to regular cells? Higher. Because they're only getting two ATPs for every glucose instead of uh, 38. So they've got to be geared up to making, to using more glucose, getting more glucose inside of them, and they're competing with all these other regular cells that are out there. How do you compete under those conditions? Well, it turns out that hypoxia in, uh, induces, and this is nothing unique to cancer cells, as I said, it happens in muscle cells as well. It induces production of a protein called HIF, which is hypoxia-inducing factor. HIF is a protein. And it's a protein that is a, something we describe as a transcription factor. We'll talk about transcription factors next term. A transcription factor. HIV, uh, H -H -H HIF is a transcription factor. I have HI on the mind, I guess. Okay? Now, a transcription factor is a protein that activates or inactivates the transcription of specific genes. So when cells need to make a certain enzyme or a certain protein, the transcription factor will bind to the DNA and cause RNA to be made so that the cell can make a lot more of that protein. HIF is made under conditions of low oxygen concentration. Next question then is, what genes does HIF turn on? And this, I think, is fascinating. Look at the enzymes that HIF turns on. It turns on a couple of gluts. And look at all the other enzymes it turns on. We've been talking about these for the past few days. Enzymes of glycolysis. Why? You've already told me the answer. Because they're doing fermentation. They need more glucose, and to handle that glucose, they need more enzyme of glycolysis to handle them. Hey, hexokinase, muscle fructokinase, aldose, bang, 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 all the way down the list. HIF is inducing the production of these enzymes. As I said, it's not unique to cancer cells. It'll happen in a regular cell. It goes hypoxic as well. In a regular cell, this makes real good sense. In a cancer cell, it's a problem. One of the strategies you might imagine for fighting cancer is to make the cancer cells starve to death. And there are a lot of people that were thinking about that. OK, well, speaking of starve to death, I didn't have breakfast. So I'm going to go have lunch. I don't want to have any hypoxia-inducing factor going on here. So I'll let you guys be, and we will uh, talk on Wednesday. Have fun. Yes, ma'am. Any oh, don't be putting that now. So, so oh, what, I'm dying now. What, so what? technically dry. I just fill in. Don't yes, dry. it will. Oh, it will. Oh, I'm dry. How you doing, Andy? <laughs> We're gonna take your final. What's gonna be on? We're final? gonna take your final. Do they ask you that all the time? Of course, do they ask you that? Are, are, they, are we instructors? Yeah. How you doing? I'm okay. How, what's gonna be on final? How many? Questions are on the phone. That's right. I mean, how do I study for the final? That's right. My studying method is not right. How do I study for the final? Read. <laughs> Try to be in That's. the first day. But you came in the middle of the term. I know. I heard the first day in August. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how you doing? Good. Um, maybe I should wait to ask a question. Okay. Um, What's the question? Well, I know that has a small percentage more. The what? High fructose syrup, or has a small yeah. percentage more fructose than yeah. sucrose, for instance. Right. Um, and that you know, we eat fruits, we're taking in right. fructose. Right. So if I were a health conscious person, I was eating a lot of fruits, fruits. in my diet, yep. and did, had cut out high fructose corn syrup, so still having plenty of syrups yep. from other sources, yep. have the same issue? Yep, it's a very good question. And it's one I've never seen addressed, and it's one of the reasons I don't eat much fruit. <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but but I think that the reason yeah the reason I I don't eat fruit. Um,
is because, in my opinion, I'm very much in the minority on this. In my opinion, fruit is mostly sugar water. There's a few vitamins. Vitamin C that's in sugar.